www.thepurchasesite.com. I'm Han Bernard, and I am joined today by two hockey blogging sensations, Jason Bruff and Mike Halford. They both write for Pro Hockey Talk on NBC.com. And since they're both going to be attending the 2014 Hockey Coaches Conference coming up in July, we thought what better way to celebrate than to come out to the beautiful downtown Vancouver and talk hockey coaching. So guys, we'll talk close to home. We'll start off there. So tell me your first initial reactions when you found out that John Tortorella and Mike Sullivan had been relieved of their coaching duties. I wasn't surprised in the least. <laughs> I thought you'd go there, yeah. After that season, were you surprised at all? No, I, it was mostly like, why did this take so long and don't let the door hit you on the way out. Those were the two sort of things that kind of came to mind. It just, it, it seemed like after Mike Gillis had been fired, that it was inevitable that Tortorella was going to be gone. We didn't know what parts of this coaching staff were going to be retained. Sullivan, no, Gillis, and yes. So, I mean, it, it all kind of played out as I thought it would, but it did take a while. That was a big thing that stuck out for me. Yeah, there was two aspects, really. First of all, the team was not good. They lost a lot of games. They didn't make the playoffs. But I think on top of that is they were boring to watch. And if you're going to win ugly, you better win because losing ugly is unacceptable. Yeah, for sure. So I'm not one to really dwell in the past, but you got to take a look at the comparison. In Vancouver, you have to. For sure, yeah, yeah. of course. Of course we do. But I'm not normally the one to, but... Looking at Elie Mignon's season, his first season in New York, compared to John Tortorella's first season in Vancouver, obviously the Rangers are a huge Stanley Cup winning contender. Why do you think he couldn't get the job done in Vancouver? I think there's something to a coach's message growing stale, and I think that might have been it. I also think Vigneault had less and less to work with. And when Tortorella came to Vancouver, he didn't have a ton of depth to work with. And now Vigneault in New York with the Rangers has more depth to work with yeah. than Tortorella. And Vigneault looks like kind of the hero in New York. Yeah, I think the other thing too is like coaches do get stale sometimes. I think what you saw in Nashville this offseason where Barry Trotz got let go after a very long time there. It wasn't necessarily a reflection of him deteriorating as a coach. It was that his message may have grown stale. Now with Tortorella... Yeah, <laughs> right, and I think the thing with Tortorella in New York is it might have been the opposite. I actually think it might have got burnt out as opposed to wearing out. Is it, they, played just, for they played for Tortorella. Yeah, they did. I mean, you know, they won playoff rounds with Tortorella there. They got to an Eastern Conference final. But at the end of the day, his style is very demanding, and he never seems to have more of a shelf life than two or three or four years. In the case of Vancouver, it's one. But, you know, he's a guy that will wear his welcome out as opposed to just kind of burn away, which I think is what happened with Vigneault here. With the two different personalities of Alain Mignon and John Tortorella, what kind of personality would you like to see? Between? I think the thing with, with Tortorella, I'm not convinced the Canucks hated Torts. I'm not convinced that they respected him. And I think they respected Alain Vigneault. So someone who they respect. I don't know who that is. I mean, it's, it's hard to get in the room and, and know what kind of what kind of coaches they respect, but I think some, personally someone that has success with the team for a little, you start to respect them because they're winning. Yeah, I think it would almost be like when you look at certain teams going to the draft, they say we're going to take the best player available regardless of position. I think that's something you can apply to the coaching search here is you just take the best coach you think is going to be the absolute best fit for your team regardless of whether he's got experience or he's a first-time NHL head coach or he's young or he's old. It doesn't really matter. You need someone to get that message through that group because it's not a young group. They've got a lot of guys on the wrong side of 30. A lot of them have no trade clauses, so there's not going to be a lot of fluidity on that roster. And, you know, you look around, and there are some candidates. Now, you look at who's already been hired, and I don't think it Lab Violette was ever really going to be a fit in Vancouver, but he was one of the more experienced, you know, successful head coaches. I think Trotz definitely would have been a nice fit here, but he's obviously taken the job in Washington. So the pool's been whittled down a little bit and you kind of have to find the best guy from that pool now. For sure, so now that Jim Benning is making the decision, what's your thoughts on him as the GM of Vancouver? And who do you think he's gonna? I liked, I mean, <laughs> he hasn't done anything yet, right? <laughs> he's been hired, he, he's got a, he's got a, history, yeah, yeah, he's got a good track record of scouting and developing, yeah. and that's really where the Canucks have lagged in the last little while. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing similar stories now in Pittsburgh. Yeah. They're looking for a new GM that can draft and develop players, and that's what Benning is. I mean, Mike Gillis had his strengths. He's an ex-agent, so he was good at negotiating contracts. He was good at salary cap things, but his talent evaluation, and that, that's the buzz, buzz phrase yeah, with Jim yeah. Benning, isn't it? Talent evaluator. You hear that? And the same with Tim Murray in Buffalo, the new GM there. So I think that's what Benning is. 
Yeah, I think another thing, if you look at their the Canucks front office structures, it seems like, and the buzzword too, a collaborative approach, is that there'll be more than sort of you know, one cook making the soup, there'll be a few more in there. Now, the rub there is that you generally want to have one guy calling all the shots and making that final decision because, you know, that's what you pay for and that's usually how the hierarchy goes. But you look at what they're doing right now and it seems like Trevor Linden would be the face a little bit more publicly, yeah. the guy that'll interact more with the media. Uh, Jim Benning will allow him to be more of a traditional hockey guy. He can go and kick around the ranks and hang out at Barnes, which he seems like he wants to do. Yeah, that's what he wants to do. He yeah. wants to go to junior hockey games, not, yeah. not talk on Team 1040 or whatever. Yeah, exactly. I, you know, I don't th and then I think they get on, you know, you might be able to keep the likes of Lauren Henning and Lawrence Gilman in the mix and let them do their respective jobs and maybe have a four or five person front office. I don't think it's a bad strategy, but at the end of the day, you know, you do need accountability. You do need that one guy to stand up and be like, I'm the one making the call. And at this point, I honestly don't know who exactly that would be. I know Benning's got the title as GM, but when I look at it, and I even remember in the introductory presser, when he did his Q&A with ticket holders, there was a couple times that he deferred to Linden, most notably when I he think was Linden in charge. Yeah, in most, charge. most notably in the coaching, when they were talking about who were we gonna hire as the head coach, and that was deferring to Linden. So I thought that was interesting as well. Yeah, for sure. So turning out, Barry Trotz is gonna be one of the keynote speakers at this year's conference. Obviously, a lot of people wanted to see him in Vancouver. He's now with the Capitals. But Jason, I read an article that you wrote about Willie David and the head coach for the Texas Stars. Do you see him as a fit potentially in Vancouver? Or? In Vancouver, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I personally didn't know much about Willie Desjardins. I was kind of like the, the rest of the people in Vancouver. You know, who is this guy? Yeah. Oh, okay. He used to coach the Medicine Hat Tigers. He had some <laughs> success there. Well, I didn't watch a lot of Medicine Hat Tigers hockey. And I was, I was researching it. And he seems to like to play an attacking style, move the puck type of hockey. And I think that's what the Canucks are looking for. And I think the one thing you look at is if you're going to bring a guy up from the American League and a trend, especially you saw with John Cooper in Tampa Bay, was a guy who had success with players at the American League level, was able to bring them up to the NHL, really seam seamless transition. What he did with Norfolk and guys like Andre Palat and Tyler Johnson, he brought them up and they were able to be instantly competitive and you know made Tampa Bay a playoff team. You look in Grand Rapids in the HL with Jeff Blashill did there. He's not an NHL head coach yet, but his GM, Ken Holland, is saying he's one in the making. And he's another guy, transitioned a lot of guys from the AHL to the NHL. Willie Desjardins done that in a very short period of time in the AHL with Texas. Guys like Antoine Roussel and uh, Brendan Dillon was there. There's a bunch of guys that have come up and really made the stars an effective team. They broke their playoffs stump this year, first time in five years, and they made the playoffs. So I think that that speaks very well to him. He's an older guy. Um, you know, I don't that's know interesting. That, He's yeah. 57. Yeah, that's the thing. Because I mean, if we're going to talk about the ties to Vancouver, another one is that Glenn Gullitson got retained as an assistant. Now they worked together in Dallas. Willie Desjardins actually coached underneath Gullitson, which would be an interesting role reversal. But Gullitson was, you know, barely 40 when he got that job. Yeah. And Are you he, surprised that they kept Gullitson around? Um, no, not really. I think he's got pretty good standing within the NHL. Again, I go back to how young he was when he took that Dallas job. And his second year in Dallas, you gotta remember, they brought in Ray Whitney and they brought in Yarmir Yager, and those guys were literally the same age as Glenn Gullison. So trying to coach a guy who's basically the same age as you when you really are a green, inexperienced head coach, that's overwhelming. He did a nice job there. They were in the playoff hunt both years, really, um, until the end when they kind of fell apart later in the season. I think a big testament to him was his second year there they gutted that team. They traded away Brendan Morrow, they traded away Yager. He still managed to keep that team competitive, and I think that gave him good standing, and I think that's why they retained him. Sullivan and Tortorella are a package deal. Yeah, like, it's like, deal. you guys are both gone. You gotta go, that was yeah. it. Before I let you guys go, I wanna do a little firing off questions really fast. Okay. So how it's gonna work is I'm gonna name off some UFAs, and you're gonna tell me which one you would rather like to see <laughs> in Vancouver. Okay? <laughs> Okay. okay, so t starting on a topic that we have had no problems with, goaltending, um, Hiller or Miller? Hiller or Miller? Hiller or Miller. I'd say try and get Miller for cheap. Yeah. And I, and, and, and I really do think that the Canucks should look at bringing in a veteran goalie. If they do think they are a playoff team, yeah. and Jim Benning seems to think yeah. they are, then, then I wouldn't go with Lack and Markstrom just, just for, for a number of reasons. First of all, I don't know if that's good enough, especially the backup. And second of all, I don't know if it's fair to those two to have that pressure in a big market like, like Vancouver. Sure. We've seen what happened in Toronto. Remember when they went with the, with the duo of James Reimer and Jonas Gustafson? Yeah. That didn't work out too well for them. Uh, Miller, if you can afford him. If you can't, he'll look. <laughs> okay, so Camelay or Iginla? Oh, man. That's a tough one. You these, are, these are options. Yeah, this is awesome. Yeah. I had no idea. Yeah. Yeah. Both. That's a tough one. I mean, my, my, my gut says Iggy just because I, yeah, I like yeah. Iggy, but it, it, the Canucks need some speed. 
And Camilleri yeah. offers that, but I'm still going to say Iggy because he's Iggy. All right, so last one, Molson or Vanek, two film savers. I would take Molson because he's going to be cheaper than Vanek, and I, for some reason I feel like Molson could be a fit with the Sidians. No Vanek, Molson. No, no Vanek. No, no Vanek. No, no, and I also think he's just waiting to get cash from Minnesota, so he's just like sitting there until that gets done, so yeah. All right, Molson. and finally just have to ask, so there's three more head coaching vacancies, Florida, Carolina, and Vancouver. If you had to choose where to be head coach, where would you choose? Uh... I would probably ultimately choose Vancouver because I'm from Vancouver and I, and I know the city. I like to coach in the city, but I have a feeling the better job would be for Florida so I don't crack under the pressure, which I would. I agree with you. I think I'd even take the Florida job because I could golf 12 years around. Yeah, and then I could walk. They've got really. some good young players in yeah. the first overall pick. And it's not a terrible team. I heard and they got a goalie too. Yeah, apparently. Yeah, I've heard. But uh, yeah, I think, I think it would be a really interesting job in the sense that no one would have any idea who you were and you'd be free to live your life. And I mean, Dale Talent doesn't seem like he's under that much stress. Every time I see him, he's got a tan. Yeah, so, yeah I think he's fine. <laughs> he's happy. He's yeah. on the beach. Well, thank you guys so much for coming out. This has been a lot of fun. It's going to be great to have you at the, the coaches' conference this summer. And you can be there too, so make sure to get your tickets at thecoachesite.com now so you don't miss the two-day event packed with exclusive keynote speakers all weekend. For thecoachesite.com, I'm Hannah Bernard. I'll see you next time.